The following presentation was produced by the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. First of all, I have to apologize because I was in Indonesia just a couple of weeks ago giving many talks and I, I got a virus. It's called the, the, the pony flu. It makes you a little horse. <laughs> but it's much better than what you can catch in the airport. Because in the airport you can catch terminal illness. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so, um, self-love. First of all, what do we mean by self that we love? So, and then afterwards I'll talk something about love. But first of all, about, oh, about six months ago, I decided, I'm getting old now, I decided it's time to get a, a um, Australian Commonwealth Seniors Card. <laughs> you know, just because, I don't know why, I don't get a pension, don't get anything. But I thought, well, why not? So I got online, and I sort of tried to apply for one online, but they said, no, you have to come into the office to prove who you are. Because you know, there's too many identity frauds these days. So I went into the office in Centrelink, and when I went into the office there, made an appointment, they said, oh, can you prove who you are? And I said, I've been a monk for 45 years, and I've been trying to find the answer to that question all those years. <laughs> you know, they didn't think that was funny. <laughs> so they said, no, they need some ID. Have you got your driver's license? Say, I'm a monk. Monks don't drive. Well, have you got your credit card? I'm a monk, we don't have a credit card. Well, have you got your, your bank account details? I don't have a bank account. Well, what about your, your rental agreement? I don't rent anything. What about your uh, ownership of your house? Your rates? So I don't own a house. You know what the next they asked me? They asked me, what about your marriage certificate? I said, come on, I'm a monk. <laughs> Don't have one of those either. And all of the things which they asked for, I didn't have. And they said, well, look, you know, we, you know, we can't give you anything. You just, you just don't exist. <laughs> I said, ah, that's the answer which the Buddha said, <laughs> that I don't exist. At last, I found out. But nevertheless... They still gave me sort of a card anyway because there's just too much problems. So it's easy to get rid of the monk by sort of, you know, bending a few rules and giving me a, a Commonwealth Seniors card. But nevertheless, it just shows you just how difficult it is to define who you are. But nevertheless, it's still worthwhile, you know, whatever you take yourself to be, even it may be a temporary thing, to be kind to yourself. Why? Now, there was a story in that book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, which was adapted from one of the tales in the, the Buddhist scriptures. And I must say that it was very wonderful this evening to actually to tell you a little bit about that book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, my first book. <coughs> because one of the people really involved in that, Magnolia Flora. She's here tonight. I haven't seen her for such a long time. Because what happened, is many of these stories, you know, which I've collected, some are Buddhist stories, some are adapted from other um, uh, wisdom teachings, and also from my own life. Many of those stories were really helpful for people. And there was this one lady over in Perth who said to me that, it's almost like a crime. It's bad karma not to share those stories more widely. And she said, you should write them down in a book. I said, I've got no time to write them down in a book. And she said, okay, I'll do it for you. She was really smart because when she wrote the first few stories and she handed them to me, they were terrible. 
They were hopeless. They were awful. And so I said, well, I better do it myself. She was a much better psychologist than I was. So I decided to write them down. But, you know, many of those stories, there was 108 stories there. The first 54 of those, I just wrote down in just two weeks, one hour a day. Because they were just, I let them flow. And I still got the manuscript, the hand handwritten manuscript over in Perth. There's hardly any faults in it. Because you're just writing it out by hand. Because when you are a monk and you meditate, and you're very peaceful, it's so easy to write. You just let it flow. It's like getting into the zone. So I wrote them all out, and then a, uh, a friend, who's now passed away, typed them out on a little disc. And then I came to Melbourne to give a talk at Melbourne University. And after that talk, a, a young lady came up and she said that she works in a publishing house and she said she's a Buddhist. And she said, if ever you have anything to publish, please let me know. And I reached in my bag and said, here, and gave it straight away. And uh, that was the opening the door of your heart book. And, and it's been published in so many different languages. And it's still doing really, really well in the bestseller list, especially over in Germany, which is still in the number top 10. And uh, she's here today, and that's Magnolia. Where are you, Magnolia? In the back over there. Thank you so much for being part <laughs> of sharing that. But one of the things, if you don't mind me telling, that she had cancer and she used some of those teachings, especially loving yourself and doing med loving kindness to yourself. And I was really happily surprised you're still here. Thank you so much for actually just being here. And anyway, <coughs> one of the stories in that book, which I've mentioned to bring out why it is we have a hard time of loving ourselves. What loving ourselves really means. And that was the story of the seven monks meditating in a cave a long time ago. And of those seven monks, they were as follows. Now listen carefully because there's some audience interaction in this story. I'm going to ask you a question at the end. The seven monks were the head monk, the boss. The next monk was his best friend. They'd ordained as monks together. The third monk was his brother. The fourth monk was like his enemy, called him the enemy, because they never really got on together. They had personality clashes. They were both really good people, good monks, but they just never really got on together. They called him the enemy. The next monk, number five, was a very ill monk. He was so ill that he could die any day. And the next monk was a very old monk. And he was so advanced in years that no one knew who would die first, the sick monk or the old monk. And the last monk, number seven, the last monk, number seven, was what we call the useless monk. Every time they did chanting, he'd always chant off key. Every time, every time they did meditation, he was the first one to snore. Every time he appeared in public, um, his robe would fall off. Oops. But they loved him, they cared for him, but he was a useless monk. And as I say, because I've been to many monasteries. Every monastery has one. <laughs> but anyway, they were meditating in this cave in the jungle. It was a perfect place to med meditate. <coughs> but one day, these band of brigands, thieves, murderers, found that cave in the middle of the jungle. And they thought this was a perfect hideout for them. After they'd done their nasty deeds 
they could come and hide in that cave and they could also store all of their ill-gotten goods in that cave. So it's a perfect hideout, but there was one problem. The monks had found it first. Well, the solution was easy. Just kill all of the monks. But the head monk, he was a really good talker. If he hadn't become a monk, he could have been prime minister. If he couldn't be, oops. If he could, <laughs> or he could have been a second-hand car salesman, or whatever salesman. He was really such a good talker. He actually convinced the robbers to, um, to let all the monks go except one, because he said, the only reason why you want to kill everybody is so we don't tell the location of the cave. And we won't tell, we promise, we, we keep our promises, we're monks. So he said, so the, the head of the thieves said, no, 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 I'll have to kill one of you as a warning to the rest. So if any one of the ones we let go tells the police or authorities the location of this cave, then we'll come after you, we'll catch you, and we'll do the same to you. We'll have to kill one of you as a warning. And so this head monk had the terrible decision. Who would be sacrificed so the rest of the monks could go free? Now I'm going to ask you in a few moments, if you were the head monk, who would you choose? But I will go through the list of monks first. The head monk, his best friend. Friends would do anything for you. Or your brother, and a brother too, would actually sacrifice themselves for others. Or it could be the enemy, always causing trouble, never getting on together. What about the old monk? So old, you're going to die anyway. Soon, same with the sick monk. What about the useless monk, number seven? The useless monk for his whole life had never done any real service for others. So, if you were that head monk, who would you choose? Now, if you know the story, if you read that book and remember it, keep quiet. Please don't spoil my fun. So who do you think he was suggested to be sacrificed? I hear someone said himself. If you think it's himself, please put your hand up. Okay, you're wrong. <laughs> Any other suggestions? All of them? Nah. Anyone for the, the um, useless monk? No. Nah. Yes? You're thinking of the useless monk as well. <coughs> no. I remember telling this story when I was in um, Sacramento, in California. There was a bishop there of the, you know, uh, of the um, Episcopalian Church. And he, like many people would say, said he sacrificed himself. And I said that was the wrong answer. Because the right answer just is that the head monk loved his brother no more, no less than his best friend. And he even loved the enemy no more, no less. He loved the old monk, the sick monk, and even the useless monk, the dear old useless monk. He loved each one of those equally. And more importantly, he loved himself no more no less than any of the other monks. So he had to tell the head of the thieves he couldn't choose, and he explained why. Just like I told the bishop that didn't your teacher, Jesus, tell you to love your neighbor as yourself? Did he ever say to love yourself more than your neighbor? or less than your neighbor? 
He said, as your neighbor, no more, no less. When I tell this story, so many people say he sacrificed himself. And that's the reason I bring up this story, to actually to show that we don't treat ourselves as we would treat others. We're much harder and harsher on ourselves. Which is means that we do really need to actually to practice much more self-love. To even the balance. So we treat ourselves as we would treat others. We treat others as we would treat ourselves. And that's a very difficult thing to do in our life because we're always taught to sacrifice oneself for others. And I know this is gender specific, but in my experience, it's usually the women who do the most sacrifice. And you know how that causes problems in life. So, instead of sacrificing oneself, we have a much better way of of loving oneself, but not more, not less than anybody else one knows. And this is where, uh, whenever I manage to have the opportunity to bless a marriage, which is one of my jobs, I tell people, even though I'm a celibate monk, I've married many women. <laughs> and married many men as well. <laughs> In other words, to be able to give them a marriage blessing. And in that marriage blessing, I usually look at the bride, first of all, and say, now you are a married woman, you must never think of yourself from this moment on. You're married. And then I look at the, the groom, if it's uh, a, um, a heterosexual marriage, but I've blessed um, the same-sex marriages as well. So I look at the, the other partner, and say to them, from now on, you must never think of yourself. And still looking at the, let's say the groom, I tell him, and from this moment on, you must never think of her, your wife. And looking quickly at the wife, from this moment on, you must never think of him, your husband. And they think, I'm crazy. I'm out of my mind. What are you talking about? And I say that when you do get married, thinking about yourself is called, it's not a marriage, it's, not, it's selfishness. You might as well just you know, be by yourself. It's no giving at all. But when you just think of the other partner, you get burnt out. There is the third way, which is the reason why I tell this little anecdote. And the third way is when you are married, in a partnership, you never think of yourself, nor do you think of your partner, you only think of us. You're in it together. So the self-love becomes a we-love. It's the same when people say, Ajahn Brahm, can I take a selfie? Say, no. We take we-fee. We take, there's two of us in that photograph. So it's not just me, it's we, fee. So that means we're doing it together. It's not just about me, it's not just about them. It's about us. And anyway, in that story, which anyone who wants to check on this, it's actually from the Talaputta um, uh, Terra in the Terragata. And this is uh, it's based on that. It's not quite the same. I've made many adaptions, if anyone checks it out. But in the end, what happened when the monk said, I can't make a choice? Because my love for every one of these monks, including myself, is equal. And eventually they said, they were so impressed by that, that not only did those thieves let the monks become go freely, but half of those thieves became monks, and the other half, they went off and got proper jobs. It could happen. 
and I don't see why not. Sometimes inspiration takes a person and makes them see much, much different way forward. Even on that subject about changing people, many times that I've been in prisons teaching, and when I do teach in prisons, I always make sure I keep a record of the number of hours and minutes I spend inside on community work. I keep that record as credit in case one day I have to go inside prison for doing something wrong and I always can count those times as credit against any sentence. <laughs> but there was this one occasion when I got a these days I don't go into prisons to give talks. Interesting, when I first started uh, going into prisons, I could not believe how many prisoners came to my meditation class. There was a prison population, it was only a small prison, of maybe 105 inmates. And about 102 came to my first talk on meditation. The only people who couldn't were those who were sick or in, you know, they did something wrong, they couldn't go to anything. So I was so impressed. The Australian prisoners, they came to improve themselves. And so I really wanted to, if they come to meet me halfway, I'm going to give as best teachings as I possibly can. And I was really getting into it, teaching about meditation and... Then one of these prisoners stood up. Now this was a real big guy, about six foot across the shoulders. <laughs> Scars all over him. He was one of the leaders of the gangs in the jail. And he said, can I ask a question? When anyone that big and scary interrupts me, say, yes, sir, please, yes, what question do you want to ask? <laughs> and that's when he asked the question, is it really true that through meditation you can learn how to fly over walls? <laughs> this actually happened. And then I realized why so many people from that jail had come to my meditation class. When I said it's very, very difficult, you know, really unlikely, the next time I went there were only three people turned up. And nevertheless, you know, I started to get some good relationships with these prisoners. And about maybe 20 years later, a prison officer called and they said, can you please, please, please come back to my jail to teach? And I said, I can't, I'm just too busy these days. I said another mic. They said, no, I want you. I said, why? And that's when he gave me one of these wonderful compliments, which I will always remember. And that was when he said, I've been in this prison service for most of my career, 25, 30 years, and I've noticed something very unique. This is what he said, I'm not exaggerating. Every prisoner who came to your classes, once they were released from jail, never ever came back. And he said, that was unique. Please, I don't know what you've done, but please do it again. And that really just you know, gave me such a warm, wonderful feeling. It made me start, start to think, why? What have I done? Which means that someone who's made a terrible uh, crime, once they've uh, paid off their debts, I suppose you might call, and done their time in jail, why they don't reoffend, Whereas ma many people actually do. And it was one of the reasons was that I taught those prisoners how to love themselves. Self-love. I taught them there's no such thing as a criminal. There's a person who's done a crime. But it does not make them a criminal. There's more to you than that. Please excuse me, there's no such thing as a rapist, a terrorist, a thief, a murderer. It's people who have done those things. But there's much more to them than the reason why they've been put in that jail. 
And if they can't see anything beyond the reason, the terrible thing which they've done, then there'll be no way they can ever find any freedom, any way forward. So, when a person does make a mistake, hopefully that many of you have read the, one of the first stories in opening the door of your heart, the two bad bricks and a wall, and realize that just because there's two bad bricks and a wall doesn't mean you have to destroy the wall. That's what happened to me. Two bad bricks I saw in the wall, and that's all I could see. Self-love does not mean ignoring the mistakes in your life, but seeing there's much more than the mistakes. There's a huge wall there of perfect bricks. The actual story uh, was that come to Australia, I was a theoretical physicist before, and I liked meditating and reading sutras. I was in my head. When you come to Australia and set up a monastery, I had to work. I had to lay bricks. And uh, never done that before. I tried my best, was very careful, but laying bricks is not as easy as you think. Especially if you are a perfectionist. Like I was and like many of you are. I tried to do the very best, took my time, and when the first wall was complete, only then I saw that the two mistakes in that wall, the two crooked bricks. And that really affected me. What do you do when you see your own mistakes? You just try to, to um, uh, straighten those bricks. Try to scrape the cement mortar from the wall. But it was solid. It was like, like stone. I couldn't scrape it out. So I asked the other monk who was there, Ajahn Chakro, said, um, can, we, can we buy some dynamite to blow it up so I can start again? <coughs> can we get a bulldozer to push it over? Because I was just so ashamed and embarrassed that I had made such a bad mistake and worse, everybody could see it. Every visitor who came to that monastery, we'd take them around and they'd see the two bad bricks in the wall I had built. I was embarrassed. I would wake up in the middle of the night with nightmares. I would just, every time I passed that wall, my eyes would go to those two faults and I'd think, why did that happen? For three months, I suffered. And then this gentleman came and they said, they passed that wall, said, that's a beautiful wall. And I couldn't believe they called it beautiful. I said, can't you see those two bad bricks? Are, are you blind? Can't you see that? And they said, yes, I can see the two bad bricks. But I can also see the 998 perfect bricks as well. And that's when I realized I was blind. But every time I thought of that wall, Every time I looked at it, all I'd ever see was my mistakes. I didn't know how to love myself. I was a fault finder. And of course, once I saw there's more to my life than my faults, once those prisoners realized there was more to their life than the reason why they'd been put in that jail, they seen they weren't that bad people after all. And when the, um, <clears throat> I told that story to a cancer group. You know, there's, this is a diversion, but there's many cancers are caused by inner negativity. There's, there's something you think that's missing in you. You're, you're not a good person. You've made some mistakes. You've hurt other people. That sort of mental negativity does affect your body. So when I told that, as I've told it many times, at a cancer group over in Perth, one of the sufferers of cancer came up and said that they were a builder. 
And they said, they're going to let me into a trade secret. And of course, never tell me your secrets, because I tell them on YouTube. And they go all around the world. <laughs> and the secret was that all bricklayers make mistakes. And when a bricklayer makes a mistake, they tell the clients, it's a feature. <laughs> and they charge you another couple of thousand dollars for it. This is the only house with this modern style of brickwork. And I thought that was a wonderful ending to that little story. That, you know, that we don't sort of uh, hate ourselves for our faults. We look at our faults like our features. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth in that. Because sometimes maybe you're real <coughs> reasonably successful in life. Maybe you're very successful in life. And I read a, only just a summary of a book by Michelle Obama about her life as First Lady. And, you know, to my understanding, to my experience, she was an incredible woman and did a wonderful job. But to her, she was saying that she felt that she was so inadequate and did a terrible job. It's called imposter syndrome where people feel that other people can do that job much better than you can. But the truth of the matter is, all you are seeing is your two bad bricks. You're not seeing the real full picture like other people see. And that takes away your confidence. It takes, gives you anxiety. It thinks you're hiding the truth about yourself. And so sometimes what self-love does is give yourself a much fairer opinion of yourself. And you do see the faults in you. But you don't see the faults as something to blow up or hide. But you see it as your features. And to understand that, I gave a talk at a uh, mental health week in Australia <coughs> to some... Uh, to a group of people, they weren't the psychologists or the psychiatrists or the nurses, these were the people who were the clients. Not the professors, not the people who who done all of the um, the work at universities, but the people who had actually been there and suffered anxiety, depressions, and the whole gamut of mental health illnesses. And the story which really hit them about self-love. How can you have self-love just when you know you can't have a relationship? When you just you think you can't get a job, you have all these problems in your mind or in your body. And the simile was just forests. Because I'm a forest monk. You know, I live in in, in in forests or jungles, these days in concrete jungles. But still my upbringing was you know, in a forest over in Thailand and even now in the forests of, um, of West Australia. And that's why we're building our monastery now in Newbury. You know, in forests, nature. Nature is where you learn so much. And what I learned there was looking for the perfect tree. I went through the forest trying to find a perfect tree. What's a perfect tree? My idea was one which was dead straight, not leaning to the left or the right, with all the branches perfectly in place, with no damage on the bark, with green leaves, no leaves which had had some fungus or some infestation of um, bugs eating them. The idea of a perfect tree. Number one, I could never find one. Every tree in a natural forest had always got some damage on it. It was always bent, crooked. Sometimes the branches had been torn off by the wind. And when they had been torn off, that is where the animals, the little possums and other animals and birds, that's where they make their nest. 
It was an important part of the forest. And anyway, the trees which I loved the best, the trees which I'd always go back to, and if I had a camera, the trees which I would photograph were the bent and crooked ones. The ones which was all gnarled and knobbled on, the, on their bark. The ones which had been damaged were the ones which looked the most beautiful. And from that, I said, any of you who believe that there's something wrong with you, that your damaged goods, and many of the clients in the mental health system, damaged goods. Number one, you belong. You're part of the great forest called humanity. And number two, that some of you really damaged are some of the most beautiful people. You're the trees I like the most the damaged ones. So you don't try to be so perfect. All this, please excuse me again, all this self-improvement nonsense, which people like to improve themselves on this, improve themselves on that, is that self-love? Or is that self-hatred? There's something about yourself which you're not happy with. So no, look, look at my, I've got a sort of, my pony virus, my little cough. I'm not going to try and improve that. It makes me sound sexy. <laughs> it's my sexy voice. <coughs> At least I get a bit of compassion every now and again. But anyway. <laughs> but self-improvement, aren't you good? Who told you you're not good enough? So what self-love is, is being at peace with yourself, being happy with yourself. As you look, as you are, you might even call it self-confidence. That's why that story, Opening the Door of Your Heart, the title of that book, it's a powerful story. It's not just fun and games and jokes. Opening the door of your heart, what my father told me just before he died, was only 16. I was only 16 when he died. He was told about when I was 13 or 14. He said, son, wherever you go in your life, however you turn out, please always know the door of my house will be open to you. But his house was a very small, what they call council flat. We were actually poor. I never knew that because all my friends were poor too. They had lots of migrants. You know, even though I was, you know, was English, and all my friends, we had friends from you know, Sri Lankan and African and Polish, and, and these were my friends. But I never realized that because this was a migrant area in London, it was, we were poor. I still remember, oh, I remember with a bit of emotion that my, we you know they had these mantel shelves with a fireplace underneath. And my father had put a one pound note on the shelf. And there was a coal fire underneath. And somehow or other, like a gust of wind, a breeze or something, lifted up that one pound note and it fell into the fire and started burning. And my father was so desperate to, to save that, he put his hand in the fire to try, in the coal fire, try to take it out. He burnt himself. And my mother just burst into tears. It was, you know, it was just one pound, which is, that was so important to them. And it really hurt them. So it was real po poverty, but that's one of the reasons why my father said he never would lock the door of the house, the flat. Because he was actually said, he was a bit of a joker. He said that he was hopeful that a burglar might come in realized the burglar was more rich than we were and leave us something. <laughs> so anyway, that realized that's not what he meant, his door of his house. He meant the door of his heart. It took me a long time to realize that. As a 13-year-old boy, that's one of the great things about having time 
in your life. Go on retreats. For me, it was almost a permanent retreat, being a monk. Time to really get your head around you know, this, this great wisdom. The door of your heart. Open the door of your heart. No matter how I turned out to be. That was the most important. I didn't need to live up to any standards or expectations. The love was unconditional. No strings attached. And that taught me so much about how to love another human being. To love them as they are. Not with all of the, the must-dos and, and must-achieves and must-live-up-to. Um, uh, and of course, the next stage was learning how to do that to myself. Ajahn Brahm. The door of your heart is open to Ajahn Brahm. To allow yourself to be. With all of the silly idiosyncrasies like those stupid jokes, which I know I, I just can't resist saying, just like that person who was addicted, had an addiction to drinking brake fluid. Even though he was drinking brake fluid because you get a high from it, he said he could stop any time. Brake fluid. Brake fluid. <laughs> hey, somebody got it. Yay. Thank you so much. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, sometimes, <coughs> sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed when I get on the, on the stage and talk to people. If people don't like it, well, fine. I always thought that way, that, you know, if I really sort of do a terrible talk, that's even the best. Then they won't invite me anymore. Then I can really retire and relax and have a good life. But if I do a good talk, that's great. And then I can help people. Both ways, you win. So anyway, whatever, that you made sure that you felt happy with yourself. And every time you did make a mistake, you know, you made fun of it. That's one of the nicest things about being a monk or being in life. To be able to, to love yourself is allow yourself to be imperfect. Open the door of your heart to yourself as you are and allow mistakes to happen. And laugh at them because mistakes are where we learn. That's why the, in one of the latest books I wrote about the 70% rule. The 70% rule is this because I was a school teacher for one year I was teaching high school kids in UK. And if you ever teach high school kids, you know, from 11 to 18, that, that's, that makes anyone think of leaving the world. <laughs> Finding a better job. That's good fun, though. But when I was teaching, I had to set an exam, a test in maths. And so I had to figure out how to... And I went to one of the senior maths teachers I've never done this before. How do I set a math exam? And that's when they said, don't set it too hard. If you set it too hard, then people get three out of 10 or four out of 10. Then all the students will think they can't do it. They can't do maths. It will take away their confidence. And if you make it too easy, they all get 90% or 100%. It would mean there's no purpose to it at all. It's too easy. So the teacher said, aim for 70%. Because if you get 70%, the average result you know, of my students in a maths class, that means that, you know, that it's a pretty good result. And the most important, the 30% where they make mistakes, that's where I, as their teacher, can understand their weak points. Places where I thought they'd understood but they hadn't understood it. So the mistakes were my feedback. So I could actually learn how I could set the next lessons, what I should focus on. And I thought that's a wonderful message for life. The 70, but you don't have to be perfect. 70%. If you have a partner who's 100% 
drop them. <laughs> you don't learn anything, you don't grow. If it's only 30, 40%, then drop them as well. <laughs> but if they're 70%, Wow, that's the best, because you can both learn from one another and grow from one another. Just even recently, I told a couple, just a couple of days ago, I said, I said is he perfect? I said, no, no, he's got lots of faults. I said, what about you? Have you got many faults? And the partner said, yeah, she's got lots as well. <laughs> exactly, you're a perfect match. <laughs> a lot of times, that if we can open the door of your heart to ourselves and to our partners, and to life, then we go to peace with life. And it's not just something which is passive, which doesn't grow, because when we learn to love ourselves and to love life, it means that the life we accept and we're becoming peace with life, we're learning, we're growing all the time. There's one last little simile before I finish off, and that is the simile of the, the Empress Three Questions. I told this a few days ago because people were asking, now I've got a cough. Actually, my energy levels are really good. It's just like an irritation in my throat. So how can you actually meditate or live life if your throat isn't perfect, if you're sick? if life isn't going that well for you? How can you still love yourself and love life? And that was the Emperor's Three Questions where, what's the most important time? And the answer is now, the only time you have. Who's the most important person? There's always the one right in front of you. And in life, is what you're experiencing right now. The only thing we can do with this is to care for it. And you find if you care for this moment rather than trying to get rid of it, if you learn how to love yourself instead of trying to change yourself, that's where growth happens. That's where health begins. That's where we start. You know, what we thought we were doing to improve ourselves, our relationships, our understanding, that's actually where things begin, with being kind and being loving, being forgiving, accepting, finding out what is happening right now and learning that it's not that bad. The trees in the forest are all bent and crooked and they belong, they have a purpose. So you, however you are, number one, you belong, and number two, don't try and be something you're not. Be at peace with yourself. Accept yourself who you are. And then you find the problems of life, the anxiety, the negativity which you have to yourself, which you transfer to negativity to others, that all tends to vanish. You become at peace. And with that peace, this growth. Just like with those people in the jails. They had a choice. The choice was watering the flowers or watering the weeds. If they focused on the crimes they'd done, terrible things they had done, then they'd find that negativity would just reinforce that bad behavior. If they could just look and focus on the other part of them, the good part of them, then that would grow. Remember, one of the prisoners, his name was Nick, and he was in jail for selling drugs. It's a terrible thing to do. And he felt very bad about what he had done. But the local primary school the, was trying to do a course. Even primary schools, children are exposed to drugs. I never realized that. You know, just you know, 10, 11 year olds, they're still exposed to it in some of the poorer parts of Australia. 
And the principal wanted to try and find a way to help her children in her school avoid the dangers of, of uh, the uh, illicit drugs. So first of all, she thought of getting a professor from the university, or then getting a social worker. But she had the brilliant idea of inviting one of the prisoners from the local jail to give a talk, spend the whole day in her school, teaching from the heart what happens to people who take drugs and sell drugs. He was there, he felt the pain. He felt the result of what happens when you get involved in that lifestyle, because that's why he was in jail. And I just really commend just the, the courage of that principal of that school. And I also remember Nick taking me to this big board in the schoolroom of the prison where he had all of these little cards from the school kids. Nick, thank you for coming to our prison. Not coming to our, our school, sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Freudian slip there. Thank you for coming to our, our school. We'll never take drugs. Now what you've told us what happens, that's a terrible thing. Because he had authenticity. You know, he'd been there, suffered deeply from the results. And the most wonderful thing, as he was showing all these cards from these kids, please, when you get released, please come and visit us, please. And please know we will never, never, never take drugs, not after what we've heard from you. And he was weeping. The tears which is coming right down both che cheeks. He'd actually done something. He'd watered the flowers in his life instead of watering the weeds. There's a wonderful way where he found self-love, self-worth, never forgetting sort of the bad things which he'd done, but realizing there was much more to him and much more he could do. He had a role in life. He had something he could do. And I still remember at Perth Airport waiting for a plane. This guy touched me on the shoulder, turned around. It was Nick. I'm still meditating, he said. He's obviously doing well in life once he's released. So there are wonderful stories like that. All about learning how to be at peace with yourself. Learning doesn't matter what you think of yourself. It's so easy, even a Michelle Obama can think that she is an imposter, that she's not good enough, that she didn't really have as much self-love as she could have had, even though other people loved her. So even for yourself, to remember to cultivate that self-love, open the door of your heart to yourself. You don't need to be perfect. Don't try to be perfect, because if you do, you'll miss out on enlightenment. It's a t-shirt I've seen many times here in Australia. And it says, nobody is perfect. And the second line is, I am a nobody. And the third line is, therefore, I'm perfect. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Hi, um, just got a quick question, uh, more in terms of practicality. Um, it's good that you want to know, um, like you, you learn to accept your flaws and everything, and you can think clearly what you should and shouldn't think about yourself. But what would you say to help us when, in practice, when we are in excruciating pain, the pain that just numb our feeling, uh, numb our thinking? And we, we know in the background the mindset, yeah, this is step A, step B, step C, look at yourself, like the way you look at from a third person perspective, we love you for what you did. But in, what, in that mental stage when you're just in excruciating pain for so long, you become so, so numb, what would you say 
practically like us, where okay, we are, you, are you talking about excruciating physical pain or mental pain? Mental pain, most of the time. Mental pain. Usually, the external one is the one that yeah. heals quickest, and um, it's for long duration as well. And and we don't have the time to catch up because we got bills to pay. We got people rely on us, and um, yeah, when you got real people rely on you, know, you, you just you can't look weak because if you doubt, then who's gonna look after them? Yeah, it is that uh, sometimes that those uh, things which we may have done, which may have caused people, you know, terrible, terrible things, terrible pains. It's it's there, it's done. It's you can't sort of um, go back in time and take it away. But there is the possibility, there is the choice to forgive. And oh. every now and again, you know, I read some very inspiring stories. And one of those stories which I read recently, I forget where it was, was a lady uh, who was a twin, Jewish, and taken to Auschwitz, where she was experimented on by Dr. Mengele. And, you know, just what happened to her was just really gross. And then years later, you know, she survived, her sister didn't. And years later, she actually met one of the surviving doctors who, exper who experimented on her. And she said that it was an incredible that she could, she had the opportunity, the choice to forgive. And she went with that doctor to Auschwitz as a tourist since many years later and they did this forgiveness ceremony where the doctor himself said, I don't know why I did this. You know, at that time, maybe it was fear you know what my superiors would have done to me. I shouldn't have done that. It's been hurting me for such a long time. And he made a confession and signed it, and she signed a forgiveness for him. And afterwards she said, just now she was not a victim. Now she was the winner. She was free. It's a choice which you have. This is one of the reasons why we can hold the pain of the past. And we've focused on that pain of the past. We focus on our mistakes. We want to blow up the world. At least blow up ourselves. This is one of the reasons why people do get into addictions. Negativity, running away, because they can't face what they did. But what we can do is actually we can come to this moment that my father told me that unconditional love, whatever you do, whatever you've done, the door of my heart is open. I don't know why you did that, why that happened, why things like Auschwitz or the killing fields in Cambodia ever happened. But the only way forward is to forgive, learn. This is Melbourne, I call it AFL code. Acknowledge, make it true what happened. Forgive, don't punish, because punishment just drives the truth underground. People don't admit it. And then learn, learn so these terrible things never happen again, but the only way we can do that is to learn how to love. Self-love. Hello. Um, I'm sure that um, a lot of people here, um, staying here, you guys might have like a certain knowledge about um, Buddhism. So for me so far, the reason why I can't cultivate my self-love is I'm worried too much about karma, especially the but the bad karma that's coming in the future. That's why I'm afraid to enjoy the moment. And then I want to ask you that 
what if I can cultivate my self-love now, but then when the karma comes in the future, um, and then I lost my self-love again, what should I do? Okay. Uh, with the law of karma in Buddhism, it is we have a huge store of negative karma which can never be exhausted. And we have a huge store of positive karma which can never be exhausted. Two big bank accounts. Why is it that we sometimes get bad karma coming up to us? And why is it that sometimes we get good karma coming up to us? Life seems to go very fortunate and lucky. It is because if we do cultivate positive mind states, things like love, forgiveness, kindness, generosity, peace, we actually attract other good karma. When we get negative, when we get angry, we actually attract the bad karma to us. So this is one of the reasons why that by uh, developing things like self-love and just love not just for yourself but for you know your whole family all about us you find that that develops and brings up some good karma to you how many people like to be around negative control freaks who are just always criticizing you no one likes to be around people like that kind people, forgiving people, people who never say a bad word about anybody. Those are the people you like to be around. So you can actually see, if you want to have good people around you, then you'd be a good person. So this is an example of how we can attract the good karma by having positive mind states. And one of those positive mind states is being at ease in your own skin. Being at peace with yourself. Thank you. Very good. Is there a fine line between being selfish and loving yourself? Oh, yeah. Being selfish means it's all about me. But loving yourself, being at peace with yourself, being kind to yourself, is it inspires you to spread that message to others. Just like the story of the, uh, the monks in the cave. That actually inspired uh, the, the other robbers actually to give up their, their awful trade. Being kind enough to others and spreading that self-love, going into jail, meant that those people who you know, listened to those teachings, they never ever thought of themselves as imperfect human beings, but human beings who'd made a mistake. Or even uh, more inspiring, when I talk like this at uh, a conference on mental health in Singapore a few years ago, this gentleman uh, who was a professor invited me to bless his unit in this big um, campus of mental health. And I asked him, because I saw a cross on his chest, I said, are you a Buddhist? He said, no, I'm a Catholic. I said, why are you asking me to do a Buddhist blessing? It's just an excuse to talk to you. So, And I asked him, because he wanted to praise me for my talk. And I asked him, so what are you a professor of in this campus? And his unit was schizophrenia. If any of you have ever come across family members, friends, who have paranoid schizophrenia, it's just one of the most difficult mental health issues. And I asked, how do you treat schizophrenia uh, in the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore. And he said, just like you said in the talk, I do not treat the schizophrenia. I treat the other part of the patient. 
And I was so impressed that I did my hands of worship. Sadhu, 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 that's inspiring. You know, that some people, instead of just focusing on the faults in a person and treating them to try and get rid of them, the other part of the person. So I don't know if you've got a, a partner in life. If you want to sort of change him or her, don't focus on his faults. Focus on his positive side. If you want to sort of grow yourself, love your positive side and that will grow. So I was really impressed that some people get it because you know what happens with the mental illness of schizophrenia, it, just, it seems drug them up to the eyeballs. But isn't there another way to deal with these problems? Because imagine if that was you with that disease. It's like someone's stigmatizing you and hating you. You're, you're imperfect. You just, you don't belong. Put you in institution. Lock you away. Is there another way? So of course there is. Hi. Um, so I have a question earlier um, this evening. You talked about how um, some people are there for others a lot, exhausting themselves. And that that is an important reason to cultivate self-love, to be also there for yourself. So my question is, how do I deal with a situation where I want to be there for someone, but on the other hand, find myself in a position where I am quite exhausted myself? Exactly. This is modern burnout. And of course, I have that as well, because sometimes people want to email me, talk to me after the talk, you know, can I have a few minutes with you? And so instead of doing that, I said, I can't do that. If I did that, I'd get very, very sick and I wouldn't be able to come to the talk tomorrow. So what I do is actually the simile of, of holding the glass of water. How heavy is this glass of water? The longer I hold it, the heavier it feels. If I hold this for one minute, my arm aches. After two minutes, I'm in agony. After three minutes, I'm a hospital case and very stupid. And I actually invented this simile, but I find it's on YouTube now. Other people, well, fair enough, I don't mind. But what should you do when this gets too heavy to bear? Put it down to rest. That's not being selfish. Other people need your help, but no, you rest. Because after three or four minutes, you pick it up again, you're energized, you're rested, the glass doesn't feel so heavy, and then you can perform. You can be of service to others. So this is one of the reasons why people get burned out, because they're helping others, they don't know how to relax and rest, to help themselves so they can help others afterwards. Otherwise, you become, as they say, part of the problem. So you need to have that balance to know when it's the right time that you would treat yourself just like anybody else. You say, take a rest, you're working too hard. And you have to say that to yourself. Take a rest, you're working too hard. And take that advice. And it's, it's so true that when you do rest, afterwards, you become efficient. You get, you know, say, three hours work done in two. You can help many, many people after you've helped yourself. A little simile, a guy, just uh, maybe not the best simile, but a guy got a job in the forestry department they gave him a chainsaw to cut down trees. And <clears throat> first day, he cut down many trees. Second day, maybe only about 60%. Third day, only 20%, even though he worked really hard. And the, the manager said, what are you doing? 
you know, that you know, your productivity has gone right down. And then the manager had a look, said, look at your chain and your chainsaw, it's really dull. You should be sharpening it. Well, I've got no time to sharpen it. If I that, waste all that time just sharpening it and not cutting down trees, it means my productivity will really go down. That's just like a person who wants to help others. They don't sharpen their own chainsaw. They don't sharpen up their own mind by resting. Which means your productivity goes down. There's so many people to help. So many trees to be cut. If you want to cut down those trees, then sharpen your saw. If you want to help, then you have to sharpen up your own wisdom and energy. This is nothing about cutting down trees and, and climate change and stuff like that. That's why I said it's not the best simile, but I heard this one. I thought it was pretty neat. Okay. Hi. Hi. So I, um, I'm trying to work on my practice, and I am trying to become a healer for myself so that I can heal others. Yeah. But I, there's this one quote. And it's like, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. And so how can I find, because I'm trying to find connection in myself, but how can I find connection within other people that are, are hurt? How can I bring them towards connection? Okay, one of the ways of connecting with other people is empress three questions. Now is the most important time. And that person in front of you, as they are right now, is the most important thing in the whole world. And to care for them. Don't try and cure them. Care for them. The care has to come first. When you care for another person, really you care for them, the, the whole attitude changes. You're not going to tell them what to do. And that's like, that's like superiority. That, now, I know the solution and you're just inferior to me. I've got the degrees and you haven't. But instead, you care for a person and then actually they open up to you and then amazing solutions will come. You know, they may sort of open up why, what the problem is, what they're running away from, why they're running away, why they're addicted. But you know, because you're caring for them, you're not judging them. You're loving them. I don't mean sort of anything sort of sexual or uh, emotional. You're just being at peace with them and connecting with them. Have you ever been that way and somebody just judges you straight away? It's totally unfair. They haven't got an understanding of why you're saying this, what you're doing this for. But then that means the connection is broken before you've even started. Caring is more important than curing. I just learned that, just simple things like my own mother. You know, when I was, used to play soccer in the streets in London, the, they would always uh, fall on the ground and you scrape the skin off your knees. I always remember growing up with scabs on the knees, just playing soccer, but when you did um, scraped the skin off and the blood came out and it started to hurt, you'd run to your mother and your mother, my mother would just um, kneel down and kiss both the knees. She called it kissing it better. And it worked. <laughs> Immediately the pain went away and it's also, I don't know why, this was um, an open mouth on an open wound with all those germs, but it never ever got infected. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes if you work, do work in a, a caring profession, like a nurse, it's just a terrible that nurses don't have time just to sit next to a patient and just talk or just hold their hand. Somebody showed, they sent me some really nice videos about a horse. A horse has been taken around wards, an like actual horse, of people who were dying in the palliative care. And just amazing, just this horse was just nuzzling up to people who, you know, just been, you know, dying and just really negative. 
and just you know, the care from an animal. I've seen that done with dogs before and cats, but never before by, by a, uh, a horse. It's amazing, just a little bit of kindness and care. It is so therapeutic. And people actually heal. So that's why caring was more important than curing. And even, oh, I remember this, this um, we did a little um, exercise of, you know, like dying. We had <coughs> two groups, split them up, A and B, and then we pretended, when I rang a bell, that the A people would pretend to have like a heart attack. And, you know, and fall onto the floor. And the B person, this was people in a, in a hospital, and the B person would actually try and resuscitate you. And then afterwards, we'd have the feedback session. What did it feel like that people trying to resuscitate you? And they said, it was such an intrusion on my privacy. You know, this was one of the most private parts of your life, dying. And they felt, just you know, Keep your eyes open, look at me, don't, don't, don't go away, help is coming. And they were just so forceful on you. And so then we, when we, we swapped the roles over, and the A's and the B's changed over, and the, the B's this time had the heart attack simulated, pretended, and then the A's, it's okay, if you want to die, you can die, but it's peaceful. <laughs> There's a much better scenario. I've only seen little clips, you know, of emergency room. And just imagine, if I had a heart attack, and all these people were rushing around after me, and putting this in me and that in me, and just, and just going frantic, that would probably kill me. Can't we do it better? With a bit more kindness. So it's an interesting scenario and concept. We're so afraid of dying and addictions, we get more addicted. Hi, John. Yeah. We're now going to care for you. Really? Because we're out of time. Aww. So very shortly, we're going to let you go home and rest. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. So, so I hope you enjoyed some of this and hope it was useful for you. And if there's some other questions, there were no questions from the, the higher realms. <laughs> Up the top there. So anyway, because people who live, who um, sit in the, the higher realms, they're usually much wiser than the people <laughs> down in this level. So you probably don't need so many questions. Very good.